This is not my war. This is our war. And you all didn't start it. The establishment started it. But I will tell you one thing. You all are going to finish it. Let, let, let's talk about, let's have a partner's discussion about Alabama. In Alabama, the elites, the permanent political class, as personified by Mitch McConnell and Stephen Law and Karl Rove and that clique that's been running this town for 30 or 40 years, raised over $30 million dollars to go after a good and righteous man, Judge Moore. And this was, money was not used to debate the great issues of the day. It was not to debate illegal immigration or America's foreign policy or Obamacare. That money was used to destroy Judge Moore and his family. The politics of personal destruction, as personified by the permanent political class, is the only way they can win. Now, Judge Moore raised about two million bucks, right? Two million dollars versus 32 million. The entire contest, and a lot of folks called up and said, hey, you know, donors want to give money to Judge Moore. I was telling folks, as a private citizen, you know, I don't think that's smart. We have to prove the theory of the case down in Alabama. This is a test of wills. And we're going to determine down there who is more powerful. The money of the corporatist or the muscle of the people. You know why all those folks are back there, the world's media, you know why they're down here taking these photos? Yeah, this is not about me. It's not about Seb Gorka. It's not about Laura Ingram. It's not about Tony Perkins. It's not about Mark Meadows. It's not about our beloved Commander in Chief, Donald J. Trump. They're here because of you. They fear you. And they fear you because they understand you've had. You've had a belly full of it, and you're taking your country back. And from the city of London to Beijing to the Gulf to Washington, D.C., Silicon Valley, Wall Street, they're nervous. And you know why they're nervous? They understand that you're the transmission of the best values of the Judeo-Christian West. The one thing we proved in Alabama, and you guys prove more than anything else, is that money doesn't matter anymore. In the days of the internet, in the digital era, the, uh, the internet's helped disintermediate the mainstream media and the party bosses. And what it's done is made the analog world even more important. That a good man with good ideas, with good people to back him up, can beat any amount of money. Here's what's so unbelievable about Alabama. They think the good men and women, the sons and daughters of Alabama, just like they think of the working class folks and middle class folks at the country, are a bunch of morons, a bunch of idiots, a bunch of rubes. They think 30-second TV spots, tens of millions of dollars of 30-second TV spots, can change people's opinion. Well, it can't. The most powerful thing is an authentic candidate, whether that is Donald Trump or whether it's Judge Moore, with good people going door to door and knocking on the door and telling people with passion, this is who you ought to vote for. You know who taught us that lesson? Barack Obama. You may not like Barack Obama's policies. You may not like him as a president, but let me tell you, as a politician, he knew exactly what he was doing. Rudy Giuliani a good friend of mine, a man I really respect, stood on that stage in 2008 
to mock and ridicule him in front of the Republican convention. Had that great line, what's a community organizer? I'll tell you what it is, somebody could kick your ass. Twice. But the grassroots of the Tea Party and the evangelical Christians and the conservative Catholics learned that lesson. You too can go door to door. You too can ring doorbells. And folks understand when you come to the door and your lived experience, they respect you. So when you talk about a Donald Trump or you talk about a Judge Moore, it means something. In Alabama, you folks were able to turn the tables. You made, you took Mitch McConnell's money and you took it from his biggest asset to his biggest liability. The more money they spend, the fewer votes they get. Now, Mitch, I, I don't know if you're watching today. I don't know if you're watching Value Voters or you maybe you have your staff. But if I, can, uh, if I can take a little rift on Plutarch and Shakespeare, up on Capitol Hill, because I've been getting calls, it's like, it's like before the Ides of March, right? The only question is, and this is just an analogy or metaphor, whatever you want to call it, they're just looking to find out who's going to be Brutus to your Julius Caesar. Yeah, Mitch, the donors, the donors are not happy. They've all left you. We've cut your oxygen off, Mitch, okay? The, the money, money's not courageous, but money is smart, okay? And right now, money's sitting there saying, hey, I see these folks. They're worked up. They're mad, and they're mad for a reason. Here's one of the reasons they're mad. And by the way, Southern Poverty Law Center, can you do me, do me a favor? You talk about hate and everything like that. Why don't you go talk to your corporatist clients that give you all the money to run these folks down and ask them about the economic hate crimes they've been pulling on the working men and women of the United States of America. Why don't you answer for them? Why don't you answer for all the foundations, all the foundations of all these guys that put that money in, and let's look at their economic crimes. They've gutted this country. And you've taken their money and you call these good people hate crime perpetuators because they try to put forward the best values of a civilization that's been around for thousands of years. That's a hate crime. We're in the valley of decision. This is the fourth great turning in American history. We've had the revolution. We've had the Civil War. We've had the Great Depression and World War II. This is the fourth. And we're going to be one thing. It's going to take 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years to go through this. And we're going to be one thing or the other on the other side of it. We're either going to be the country that was bequeathed to previous generations and to you, or we're going to be something else. And in that valley of decision, it's not about Mark Meadows and Donald Trump, and Ted Cruz, and Mike Lee, and all the, all the great leaders of the conservative movement, Vice President Pence, Laura Ingram, Steve Bannon, Seb Gorka. The burden's on you. The burden's on your shoulders. On the morning of November 8th, right, I knew as I told the president the entire time since so I stepped in there in August when he was, you know, 16 points down, double digits in every battleground state, 70 on the generic ballot, got to be at 90, no money, not a lot of organization. I said, we can pull this in together. You're going to win 100% metaphysical certitude you're going to win. On Billy Bush Saturday, everybody's running for the exits. Everybody's jumping ship. Nobody's making justifications for what the president said, including the president of the United States, or that time, candidate Trump himself. But I told him, 100% metaphysical certitude, you're going to win. Because folks are looking for change in this country. They're looking to take their country back, and you're the vehicle and instrument that's going to do it. 
and they don't care about locker room talk because we're going to bring to that debate the women that William Jefferson Clinton attacked and his wife covered for him. And we're going to let the American people decide between your words and his actions. That's why I'm a street fighter. I'm all about winning. You know why? Because we have to win. This next 15, 20 years, and I would love to tell you, we could wave wave a magic wand, I'd love to tell you that President Trump, the goodest man as he is, that he could snap his fingers and it would all be better. But it's not. Every day is going to be a But here's the good news. I know you wouldn't have it any other way. Let's go back to Alabama for a second. You know, since uh, the Associated Press called Judge Moore at, uh, I think, 9 o'clock at night in, in Montgomery, Montgomery Town, rough around there, he, he had won by, what, 10 points, roughly 10 points over Big Luther. Earlier in the day, there had been a bigger, bigger victory. Bob Corker. Bob Corker. You know, a real piece of work. He had called the president. This is a guy that had, what, $6 million of cash in the, in the bank or thereabouts. Had uh, uh, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, most prestigious on Capitol Hill, and the one you can raise most money on besides the banking committee. In a state that, what, President Trump won by 22 points, some, some outrageous number. He didn't have an opponent. There's no opponent. And according to him, now President Trump disagrees with this, according to him, President Trump said he'd endorse him. Money, prestige, no opponent, an endorsement of the President of the United States. And he quit. Because he just saw, he had called over and talked about the exit polls, right? What was happening down in Alabama. And he knew the good men and women in Alabama were holding Mitch McConnell accountable down there, and they were going to hold Bob Corker accountable too. Now, now they've said in this this civil war inside the the Republican Party that um, you know why are you going why are you going after folks why are you going after folks like Barrasso and Deb Fisher and and Heller and all these guys that that, that vote the right way. You know, as Bob Corker has trashed the commander-in-chief of our armed forces, while we have young men and women in harm's way, right? Well, he said he's leading them on a path to World War III, that he is not stable, that people have to keep him moderated, that it's an adult, it's what, an adult center, and they took the morning shift off, while some U.S. senator in a position of that authority for the first time in the history of our republic, has mocked and ridiculed a commander-in-chief when we have kids in the field? Have I seen Barrasso come to a stick and condemn that? Have I seen Deb Fisher come to a stick and condemn that? Have I seen Heller come to a stick and condemn that? You have not. And let me give a warning to you. Nobody can run and hide on this one. These folks are coming for you. The day of taking a few nice conservative votes in Hyden is over. These folks are not rubes. These folks are not morons. These folks are not idiots. Okay? You know, I'm a graduate. I'm actually an honors graduate of the Harvard Business School, and I worked at Goldman Sachs. And if you ask me if I would rather be governed by the first hundred people that walked into this conference today or the top hundred partners at Goldman Sachs, I would take the first hundred people every day of the week. Because the common sense, decency, intelligence, grit, and determination would ensure that our country is safe and prosperous, and so would the world. And let's look at these elites. And the reason 
we position you know, Hillary Clinton as the guardian or the tribune of a corrupt and incompetent elite. Look what these geniuses have left for, for President Trump where they said, oh, this guy's unfit. This guy's unfit to be commander-in-chief. No, he's unfit to do this, unfit to do that. Look what they've foisted upon President Trump in the first couple of months of his administration. You got the Bay of Pigs down in Venezuela. You have the Cuban Missile Crisis in Korea. You got Vietnam and Afghanistan. That's not his doing. This is what all these geniuses have been doing for the last 20 or 30 years. This is the same crowd that said, hey, if we just let China have most favored nations and let them in the WTO, they're going to be, as they get wealthier, they're going to be a liberal democracy and free market capitalism. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that played out well. China's been a, a Confucian mercantilist society for 4,000 years. They know what they're doing, and they're not changing. They're running the tables on us right now. They're at full economic war with us right now. Don't ask me. Look at The Economist. Read J.D. Uh, Vance's Hillbilly Elegies, the, the cultural undertones of the Trump revolt. Read the studies coming out of MIT and Harvard that says there's a direct correlation between the factories and jobs that leave for China in the opioid crisis. This populist, nationalist, conservative revolt that's going on, that drove Donald Trump to victory, that drove Judge Moore to victory, that will drive 15 candidates to victory in 2018. And well, and I hate to break the news to Graydon Carter and the folks, good folks at Vanity Fair, but yes, President Trump's not only going to finish this term, he's going to win with 400 electoral votes in 2020. Now, why is this a populist revolt? Real simple. You guys have more common sense, more understanding of what we need to do, and more decency than the elites. And, 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 and the first order of business is to, is to undo all the damage of globalism, right? That allowed Silicon Valley and Wall Street and Hollywood and the imperial capital right here in Washington, D.C., and London, and Beijing, and Davos, right? The party of Davos. It's undue globalism. The reason we need populism and the need to get it formed up is that there's bigger and more crucial decisions coming down the road in the next 10 or 20 years. The convergence of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, the computer chip. There are going to be decisions in front of mankind in the next 20 years that man's never had to face before. And if you think that the elites that got the world into the situation it is today are going to make the right judgments 20 years from now, you're sadly mistaken. It's folks like you that have to tell folks this is not a science experiment. This is not an engineering exercise. You're free men and women in the greatest republic in the history of Earth. And, and why, why are we nationalist? It's not ethno-nationalism. These guys can run that drill all they want. It's economic nationalism. It doesn't matter what your race is, your ethnicity, your gender, your religion, your sexual preference. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. As long as you're a citizen of this republic, that's what matters. Yeah. Economic nationalism is what binds us together. Economic nationalism and understanding we're going to bring those jobs back. It's not the second law of thermodynamics why they left. There's no inexorable law that took those jobs to Asia and those factories to Asia and left us with gutted communities of opioid addicts. That was human agency. That was decisions of men and women that did that. And it's decisions of men and women that are going to bring those factories back and bring those jobs back.
the, the smart folks in the Democratic Party, and trust me, there are a lot of smart, smart folks there. They understand that. They had that conference six weeks ago, no identity politics, because they know identity politics is a loser. I knew it was a loser. When we took the campaign over, remember, Trump was 16 points down. They said, oh, my God, he's gonna, he knows he's going to lose by 25 or 30 points. So he brought in the mad bomber, and he's going to just destroy his enemies on the way down, right? And what you saw was a highly disciplined campaign run up on these themes of populism and economic nationalism, right? The rule of law. And Hillary, you know, Hillary came out. She, she was on the beach raising money because, you know, they, they were running a four corners offense. She came out. She, 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 she came out after about a week. And she had that thing. I'm sitting in the war room. We had all these TV sets and all the young men and women there that worked on the rapid response before. She hadn't given a speech in a month. She came out. It was Breitbart, alt-right, ethno-nationalism, white supremacist, Bannon. And I sat there and I go, if that's it, if that's what she's going to bring... We're going to run the tables on her. One thing about economic nationalism, it does, and, and by the way, I understand all of us don't agree on everything. I understand that there's plenty of folks over at Cato and AEI and, and, and uh, Heritage that we have to convert. And we don't, we don't, they don't totally agree with, you know, that free trade is a radical idea. Right, that no vibrant nations ever ever really agreed with that. The Chinese certainly don't. Japanese certainly don't. Koreans certainly don't. That's why they got the manufacturing jobs, by the way. But economic nationalism, one of the parts of it is that it's a centerpiece of value voters. For too long, this Austrian school of economics had us thinking that everything's about the economy. That you gotta look at the jobless rate six weeks before the election, because that's gonna determine who wins the election? That everything's about the gross domestic product and the rate of growth and the unemployment rate. You know, all those stats that are very important. That's not it at all. You know, we're a civic society in a culture that has a capitalist free market system as our economy. But we're not an economy. And you're not just units of production. You're, 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 you're free men and women in a civic society. Under underpinned by a capitalist system. But where other people in the world don't practice capitalism, we have to be savvier than that. We have to be smarter than that. And we will be. President Trump's seen to that, his whole trade agenda. And that's what won us Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan and Iowa and almost won Minnesota at one point. That's how you're going to win 400 electoral votes. Democrats understand this. They understand that they've got to come back with some sort of economic program, but it'll just be trump light. It'll just be trump light. President Trump has had these ideas and believed this for 30 or 40 years. He's a very savvy businessman. He didn't come to this party late. He ran for office late. Let me just tell you about President Trump because I had the honor of, of seeing him up close. You know, this is a guy that's worth billions of dollars. I don't know if it's four, five, seven, eight, ten. At some point, you've got to quit counting, right? A beautiful wife, tremendous kids, great grandkids, a loving family. The friends he has are unbelievable. You see the friends and the love that they have for him, of somebody that's hung out for him, with him, for decades. These, these people love him. He, he has a business with the finest hotels in the world. He was buying not just golf courses, but at, at the age of almost 70, buying championship golf courses that he'd even make even better and put him in the uh, British Open or the Open Championship Rota or the U.S. Open. Things that could really be legacies for him. You know, he didn't do this for any kind of ego gratification. Because tell me, let me tell you, you don't understand how they try to destroy him. And how tough it is every day when they come after you. And they come after your family. And they come after your kids. And they come after your friends. And they come after your business. They weren't there to debate Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton just did a 900-page book or whatever. She's going around the country. She still can't tell anybody why she should be president of the United States. <laughs> she, she can whine about, you know, all the, all the bad things that she thinks happened to her, but she can't make a convincing case of why she should be president. She can't take on any Donald Trump's ideas, didn't want to do that. They wanted to use that $2 billion just to destroy him. But on the morning of the 9th, I think we won at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was called 3 o'clock in the morning. That coalition with Reince Priebus and the RNC, um, you know, we won. As I always knew we would. But the key that picked the lock 
in North Carolina, in Florida, in Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Iowa, in Michigan, in Wisconsin was you. Ask Tony Perkins. He's got the numbers. He'll walk you through. The turnout of evangelical Christians and conservative Catholics in those key districts, that is the difference in victory. I was most nervous about North Carolina. It was not the weekend before, but the weekend before that, that I was down in North Carolina with the president, Mark Meadows. And Mark Meadows came up to me and said, we got this. He said, we got this. I said, Mark, I don't know. It's, it's pretty tight. I'm very nervous. He says, we got this. He says, the evangelicals are going door to door. They're getting that vote out. Conservative Catholics are going door to door. The hobbits are going door to door in the Shire. And they're getting everybody out. Th- that's why they fear you. They understand, trust me, they know all the math, right? They know all the math. They know what you did. They know what you did in Alabama. But on, on, on November 9th, I will tell you one thing, because I was the CEO of it. You know, we were a little bit the island of misfit toys, right? <laughs> because it only come together in 88 days. But I will tell you, and I had a conversation with Jeff Session one time when he was under the most pressure over at DOJ. And I asked him flat out, I said, Senator Sessions, is there any doubt in your mind that the hand of providence was critical for our victory? He said, absolutely. Divine providence, divine providence worked in that victory, just like divine providence worked on Judge Moore. Now, the hand of providence doesn't work as some sort of magic or voodoo. It's through human agency, and that's you. And we're going to have a lot of these conversations. We're going to have a lot of fights ahead, right? And the first one is before we can get to the progressive Democrats and the Southern Poverty Law Center and all these folks we've got to take on, and we're going to take them on, And we're going to stand them down. Okay? There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. But there's a time and season for everything. And right now, it's a season of war against a GOP establishment. It's no longer acceptable to come and pat you on the head and tell you everything's going to be fine. Just get these guys in office. Those days are over. We need to move with urgency. The President of the United States deserves respect and deserves their support. Of all the insults that Senator Corker threw at the Commander-in-Chief in a time of war, the worst thing was You know, it was Phil Rucker, I think, at the Washington Post, and I think it was Jonathan Martin, Peter Baker over the New York Times. They had the buried lead. Buried lead is about 20 paragraphs down. What Corker said, he gave up the game. He said, hey, there's only one or two senators up here that have any respect or admiration for President Trump. The rest of them all talk like I do, behind closed doors. So... All of you folks that are so concerned that you're going to get primaried and defeated, you know, there's time for mea culpa. You can come to a stick and condemn Senator Corker. And you can come to a stick, a microphone, and you can say, I am not going to vote for Mitch McConnell for majority leader. And you can come to a stick... And you can say, I'm going to do away with the filibuster so the president can implement his program. Now, Senator Barrasso and Senator Fisher and Senator Heller and the other one of you folks, Senator Hatch, if you do that, these are good folks. They may reconsider. But until that time, they're coming for you.
I've gone over mine a lot of times, so I'm going to wrap up here in a second. <laughs> you sound like my colleagues in the White House. <laughs> Not. <laughs> I'm going to come out and give you a hug. <laughs> It's the last thing. The president needs our support more than ever. Look what happened. And here's what happens when the president knows he, he has your support. Because, you know, let's have a part in this discussion. The president had some bad information given to him and some bad advice given to him and, and uh, you know, had some folks telling him things that just weren't so. You know, and I would kind of told him what was going to happen down in Alabama, where I was going to stand with the men and women that got him into office. But let's look at what's happened since Alabama. A 70-point program for DACA, including 20 deal killers. And, and, and just to make sure that uh, Durbin and Nancy Pelosi got the joke, so many White House officials said, oh, by the way, no pathway to citizenship. Right? That was the first thing, DACA. The next thing, you had the Religious Liberty EO that was gutted back in, in, in what, May? Surprise, surprise, surprise. A 25-page memo from Attorney General Sessions. The whole, you know, uh, Little Sisters, the Poor thing, everything turned around. Number two, right? Got out of UNESCO, number three. Yep, yep. Got uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin said, it's going to be a middle-class tax cut, and it's going to have the small business tax cut. This is going to be middle-class and for working-class people, I guarantee you. Then you had Obamacare, not going to make the CSR payments, going to blow that thing up, going to blow those exchanges up, right? And lo and behold, we're going to decertify and get out of the RAND deal and name the IGRC a terrorist organization. Those are not random events, folks. That is victory but gets victory. We owe that to Judge Moore and the good men and women in Alabama because that all came from them. Every day is like Christmas Day now. I can't wait to get up. It's going to be a new package uh, this is the Trump program. This is what we always wanted. Heck, next week, they're going to, I hope, I think they're going to announce the Muslim Brotherhood of Terrorist Organization and move our embassy to Jerusalem. Oh, that's right. Mitch McConnell now is working triple time on getting those judges approved, right? Funny how that all works. Victory begets victory. It's very simple. We keep winning, and good things are going to happen. We keep winning, and your country's going to be saved. We keep winning, and you folks, you, are going to be the folks who saved the Judeo-Christian West. Now, we don't have anything to offer you except a lot of work. And we're going to lose, by the way, they're going to be gray skies, and we're going to lose. We're going to lose some. It's not going to be all victories. We're going to have good days, and we're going to have bad days. And this is going to take a long time. And it's not any one election. It's not a November 9th or September 26, 2017 it's going to have to be every day. It's going to have to be every day. But if you folks don't do it, and the, peoples that, the people that you are proxies for, your organizations, it's not going to happen. We're going to lose this. But I can guarantee you one thing. There are good men and women out, out there that saw the lesson of Judge Moore and Donald Trump because the lesson 
that the media, the opposition party, and the money on Wall Street and the permanent political class tried to do was to say, if you stand up, you'll be destroyed. If you go against what they stand for, you will be destroyed. But folks out there know, if you have their back, you are the key that picks the lock. There's a um, Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, that says, I think, 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago, that uh, the leader's best, that when the main objectives are achieved, the people themselves say, look what we accomplished. That means it's all on you. It's not Donald Trump. It's not Mark Meadows. It's not Ted Cruz. It's not Laura Ingram. It's not Steve Bannon. It's you. So tonight, when you pray for your country and the servicemen and President Trump and his family, say a prayer for yourselves. Because 100 years from now, they're going to look back and they're going to hold you accountable for what you did in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if we stick together and show the same tenacity, the same grit, the same courage as you showed in Alabama, we're going to win and they're going to lose. Thank you. Fantastic.